Hey everybody, Jenny Clift here for another episode of our Better Business, Better Life podcast. And today I'm really excited to welcome Nick Thompson, who we've been talking about doing this for so long and we're finally here. So I'm in Bali and just been getting absolutely no sympathy from Nick about the, the weather here. Um, my biggest issue is, you know, the dropping frangipani and, you know, get, getting a swim in between the, in between meetings. And Nick is in Calgary in Canada where snow is forecast pretty much any moment. Any moment. Any moment. So, uh, Nick Thompson, welcome, fellow EO member, fellow EO trainer, which is how we know each other. And topic really for today, Nick, is your book, which I love the title of, Look Out, You're About to Get Effed, and the 13 Biggest Pitfalls of Business and How to Avoid Them. And what I love about this is this is from your lived experiences and from actual experiences, not about, um, you know, reading a book or, you know, hearing about other people or, you know, get taking that advice. It's actually from lived experience in your own entrepreneurial journey. So share us a little bit about your story and who you are. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jenny. And thanks for having me on your show. It real, it's a true honour to be across the world on the other side of the world and uh, and be able to connect with you this way so i appreciate it uh my my entrepreneurial story um went back to uh, after university i uh, worked on i ran ski schools and did marketing for ski hills for for 10 years so i skied professionally for 10 years and uh ended up getting in business with my parents my parents were looking for a small company to fund that uh, that could be their retirement plan and uh, asked me to join them. Asked my brother as well, and he's in the arts and said, business, no way. So I said, you know, anything to do with marketing uh, uh, would be su super fun. And so we found a small business. I was the fifth employee. And four years later, they said, you're good. Uh, time to buy us out and retire. And so uh, that was at about 12 employees in the year 2000. That's when I joined EO. Uh, so just over 22 years uh, wow, in 22 EO. 22 years, yeah. Crazy. And since, uh, so I ended up, uh, and I all, honestly, all success I attribute to the network, connections, tools, learnings from EO, as well as all the tools so you, you know, we teach uh, Accelerator, you uh, are heavily involved in EOS, all the best practices and tools. I implemented them, grew the business um, from just qualifying for EO uh, with about uh, 20 employees at the time to 350 employees, uh, 20, lo uh, 20 office locations in North America, warehousing on five continents, and um, and just topping over the hundred million uh, gross revenue mark, and again I attribute it all to EO and uh, the tools and the network with EO. Uh, during that time, of course, there's lots of highs and lows in business, uh, lots of partnerships, lots of uh, uh, horror stories, and 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 some great success as well. So definitely a, a roller coaster of emotion, um, and and. During that time and since that time, I've uh, incubated, uh, grown and exited a number of other companies as well, um, using the same sort of network and, and tools. And uh, upon a very tumultuous uh, exit from my original company, uh, which I write about um, very vulnerably, I might add, um, I came to... I came to, I'm a big proponent of all the uh, business best leaders and, and thought, thought leaders, the books like, you know, Jim Collins and Adam Grant and Simon Sinek. And I'm, I'm a huge, you know, student of that and believe in it heavily. But what I noticed was there isn't a book out there that says, here are all the things to look out for, right? Here are all the dangers of business. And it's not that sexy, right? <laughs> it's a little bit yeah. depressing, actually, when you talk about all the dangers and the pitfalls. And I said, you know, I've lived through a lot of them. And I know a lot of people in, in our network in EO and, 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 you know, from news stories and that sort of thing that have gone through the similar pitfalls I have. I'm going to write a book 
that has, and 13 was a very purposeful number. Um, forum mate told me you got to make it 13. I had 12 at the time. And, uh, uh, so, so I came up with the 13 biggest pitfalls of business. So my story was, is intertwined. And I add in all sorts of other real stories to say, hey, this company went through it, this business owner went through it, and some, some public ones that people will recognize as well, just to you know, make sure that people understand this isn't a one-off pitfall, this can happen to any business, um, and, and what to look out for, and then tips on how to avoid those, those pitfalls. Nice. So it's, uh, it's taken I'll, I'll come off. back to a- Y13. So yeah, but I'll come back yeah. to that. So. Uh, it was Amazon bestseller and it's taken off and, mm-hmm. um, and I'm doing a lot of podcasts and webinars across the globe. Um, really just to, I don't make money from it. Quite frankly, I'm doing it because I want to put this in the hands of entrepreneurs. To, nice. to help because that's the community that we love, right? Yeah. And I, I love, I, and I see this so often with EO is, and particularly our training community, actually, of, of we're really in that phase, I guess, in our business or our life um, where it's, it is kind of that give back, um, back to, give back time. Um, right. So two questions we always ask at the start of our, uh, our podcast is share with me two wins, a personal and a professional, maybe from the last year uh, or, sure. or less than that, um, the professional one? Yeah, so a uh, professional one in 2023. So my wife and I have a new business. It's virtual executive assistant and bookkeeping and online business managers. So we hire out virtual uh, employees, if you will, to, uh, to companies across North America uh, on a contract basis. Um, and it has grown in leaps and bounds, uh, this year we've been able to, uh, really focus in on our key core best type of client. Um, and you'll know that. And, um, uh, we've really been able to focus in on that. We fired a bunch of clients that didn't fit our core values and we've been able to really hone in on, on who we work with best. So that's been a a great success this year professionally. Nice. Uh, I love that. I'm, I'm now working with Will Scott in uh, with the Culture Fix, and um, and a big part of that, you know, it's not only the values, but it's and um, or it, it, it's deeper than just the values. I should say, it is not only your staff; it is also your clients. You know, making sure that everybody fits in that, because you know, if I look back through our business and the really difficult, prickly customers that you know, when they rang, that you kind of went, oh no, what do they want this time? Um, just moving those on just makes it a much nicer place for everybody. So you got it. super critical. Yeah. yeah and a personal win. Yeah. And, and personally, we, we had some challenges this year with some family health issues. Um, my wife's uh, mother and grandmother got uh, ill at the same time. And wow. uh, mom was taking care of grandma. So, uh, so we actually went and spent, we lived with them for, for three months in, uh, on Vancouver Island. Uh, helping them through through that, and so it's been uh, quite a difficult year, and we've come to the point now where everybody's getting the care that they need, and we've got everything sorted out. So we've been able to, you know, free up uh, ourselves uh, again to to reconcentrate on you know our growing our lives again. So uh, it's great to have family taking care of where they need to be taken care of. Nice, and you've managed to um, to pull together the the business and the values and getting that work done as well. It's uh, right. it's like the perfect storm, isn't it? Um, it was, yes. So, and I'm sorry to hear about the illness in your family, but good to hear that uh, that it's all um, sort of back. Um, sounds like it's on track. Uh, Some, somewhat on track, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good. So tell me with the book, why 13? You said that somebody in your forum or yes. somebody in EO said it has to be 13. What's the 13 so, number? So um, and I think it's more of a North American thing, Jenny, because I've had that question from from people in other countries. Um, 13 is considered a bad luck number in in North America. I'm not sure where else it is. Um, yeah, my, my son's born the 13th of Friday, the 13th of January, okay. which always kind of joke that it's, uh, you know, we should have known. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's why we thought, you know, 13 was an appropriate number for, you know, for the pitfalls. Uh, personally, it's a good luck number in my family always has been. Uh, I okay. got married on the 13th. Um, on purpose and, uh, it's always, you know, I wear the number 13 during with sports. Um, but 
the norm is, it's supposed to be a bad luck number. So uh, okay. that's why we picked it. Yeah. So go with the uh, and and I guess it fits, you know, the thirteen pitfalls. So uh, yeah, and uh, I'm sure there's uh, more than thirteen. How did you narrow it down to thirteen? That's the that's the other thing. So I was actually uh, at, at lunch with a, a colleague today that said, uh, "Hey, listen, you uh, I've read your book, and there's at least another thirteen you could write." And I said, "Yeah, it might it might lend its way to the second book for sure." <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The uh, what's the next one? Uh, you're about to get effed again. Here's the next again. thirteen. That's right. The next thirteen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'll write that down. Yeah. You're in the credits. You're welcome. I'll uh, I'll be expecting royalties on that one. Yeah. Um, so what you said you um, sort of you know you you love looking at books and um, you. You know, there was nothing around that sort of 13 uh, or, sorry, you know, the, what to watch out for. What was the catalyst? When did you decide uh, to actually write the book? Yeah. Uh, so, again, I write, I, I write the story in the book and it's when it's on that tumultuous exit um, from the company. So w when, when we were growing to a larger size, we merged with another company. We merged boards of directors. Um, I gave up my chairmanship uh, to another partner because I had a young family at the time. I didn't want to do all the traveling. Uh, he didn't have family, uh, came from a larger company, he used to be a CEO of a uh, you know, Fortune 500 company and said, look, you know big business. I'm an entrepreneur at heart. You know big business, so you take over the chairmanship. Um, and um, as things progressed, uh, we were butting heads with, with uh, members of the board and they were, the way we built our company, I still believe this to the day, you wanna build your company, you need to build your people. And uh, they came in and said, we need to build our shareholder return, we need to cut people. And I was like, whoops, I think we might've made a mistake. So as much as I argued and fought, um, I'm one vote at that time. So, um, I got outvoted and there was a lot of cuts because uh, they saw profit on the other side of that. I saw what I call the toilet bowl effect. You know, you make cuts and then it gets worse. And then you're like, oh, we need to make more cuts. And then it gets worse. And then you need to make more cuts. I call that the toilet bowl effect. And um, it was just spiraling. And so I finally took in, in early 2017, I took what I call my last stand. And I said, if you don't change the way you treat people and we and we we start you know rebuilding people i'm gonna leave you're gonna do it without me and uh, i thought that would change people's minds and they just they just said okay bye you know so fairly nonchalantly so uh i found myself on the outside of outside of my company and um what happened after that was it kept toilet bowl spiraling and early 2020 uh, claimed bankruptcy, they no longer exist uh, oh, anywhere on the globe. Um, so people will often say to me, hey, Nick, uh, don't you feel vindicated? You were right. And I said, no, they killed my baby. I'll never get over that, right? Yeah. That, that was my baby. And so part of the journey of healing was writing, right? And so, you know, I was writing you know, all the things that happened, because you always look back and say, what, what would I have done differently? You know, hindsight's twenty twenty, And so uh, therapeutically, I was doing a bunch of writing and journaling uh, what had happened, looking in the mirror. Um, it, and it probably took me about two years to, to come to understand those were all decisions I made. And I have to take accountability for those. And in the meantime, maybe from all the lessons I'm taking out of it, I can help other companies and other entrepreneurs by actually publishing what I'm writing about. And that's how this book came to be. Yeah, that was going to be around my, my next question. We exited our business um, 18 months ago. Um, so made the decision early last year to, to um, I'd already exited, uh, Nick exited sort of this time or advised our, our partner after a merger that he was exiting as well. Right. And um I think when we met with you in Canada, uh, sorry, in the US, US. last year, um, we were in the midst of that and and I know how difficult it was for us 
going through that and it's probably not unlike what you've um, experienced. How did you manage those first few weeks? Just think back to, you know, you've said, I'll I'll leave and they said, okay, which is pretty much what happened to me. Mm. Um, How did you manage going? Because it's like grieving. It's like going through that grieving process. But Absolutely. sort of put yourself back there and, and how did you do that sort of day-to-day exit, yeah. your, your team walking away? Yeah, it, it was definitely a very difficult uh, time because um, in, in the Calgary office where I was situated, um, I had built a commercial building that they were the office was in. Um, so they're still in my building. <laughs> and so, you know, and these are people that, you know, I've come to love like family. Mm-hmm. And so I would go in, you know, once a week just to visit, see how everyone's doing, make sure they felt they were okay without me being there. You know, I didn't want them to, to, to suffer. Um, and I was told, um, you know, I was told by the, the board, you can't, you can't visit the company. Um, unless you, uh, reach out, we prearrange, it's got to be off, uh, off business hours. Cause they didn't, they thought maybe I would be in there trying to influence people to leave or whatever. Um, you know, I had obviously had a strict non-compete in confidentiality agreement and I was gonna absolutely honor that. I just wanted to see the people that you know became family, mm-hmm. uh, and make sure they were okay. So it was very difficult saying I'm not allowed to visit. Um, and, uh, and I wasn't allowed to, you know, they, you know, l- legal letter saying you can't contact anyone. And, you know, they were scared, right. That I was going to do something. Um, and I had absolutely no intentions, but you know, I understand. Um, so it became very lonely, very quickly. And I did lean very heavily on EO and on my forum group in EO, uh, for support and my, you know, my peer network. Um, and, uh, my wife is so smart. Uh, we, she said, look, you're, you know, you're a great person. You've always believed in people, you know, you're going to get through it. We're going to do other things. And she was the one that suggested that, um, I come up with some sort of a mantra for myself. Um, because I was doing a lot of looking in the mirror, like, you know, uh, uh, literally and, and, uh, um, figuratively and, you know, saying, what did I do wrong? And, and am I a bad person? And those sorts of things go through your mind. Right. And so I had a mantra that I said in the mirror every morning when I got up and every night when I went to bed that, that, you know, you're a good person, you mean well for people, you always had other people's interest in, you know, best interest in mind, and you will be able to build something else, building great people again. Um, because they will want to work with you, uh, whoever that is. And, and I would say the, this sort of mantra and, and, uh, it did take me a couple of years before I sort of landed on my feet and, and, uh, my wife had a company at that time actually. And so it, it started to grow rapidly. The company we're in now, uh, it started to grow rapidly and she said, Hey, you know, you know, all the tools and how to build people. Let's, let's, uh, this thing seems to be going somewhere and can you help me build it? So we've been growing it across North America, uh, since, since, so that's really helped me kind of refocus as well. Yeah, we, um, we had a, just an out of the blue offer. Oh, wow. Coming up six years ago now, um, to buy our business. And it was one of the options was walk in, walk out and various reasons why we didn't go down that path. But one of the main ones was again, leaning on that EO network Speaking to a few people who said that um, Nick, uh, my my Nick, my husband, uh, Nick. he and I have yeah. worked together for 27 years, who you know, um, he didn't have his what's next. And and I think um, that was sort of set us on a path of, I did, I'd already trained as an EOS implementer. I'd started to sort of transition out, or well, firstly into a role that I loved, which was people and culture in our business. But for him, he was still very invested in that business. It was his identity. And um, mm. I often joke that, you know, when I'd said, if I suggested that we sell a business, I got a better reaction at, you know, cutting, perhaps we could cut off an important part of your anatomy, got a better <laughs> response than selling the business. Um, he was just so invested 
invested and and tied up in in that business. So for you to walk away, um, you know, just putting us my, myself in your shoes of, of to that nothing. What do you do with yourself? That's mm -hmm. it's such a hard place to be. Um, yeah. And I, I I wonder if you know you see people that retire and you know, drop dead at their Christmas at their retirement party or you know right. they're dead a year later because you know you've done all this work for so many years and then go to what nothing so tell me about the business so you've stepped into your wife's business um and really sort of in that you know building the people um how did that come about was it a conscious decision or was it you know this is sort of you know i've got to do something with my time and this is here or yeah i thank you it it, it was a very a conscious decision um so i helped my wife start the business um, because i've started businesses no you know, all the steps to, that it takes. And so I helped to start it, but I know I mean, my wife is, is knows how she's, she would be an integrator extreme. Okay. Very, very well organized, knows how to implement things. And so, um, so I helped her start it and uh, she was doing that. I was um, busy, you know, grieving, coming to terms with things, writing, you know, writing the book. Um, and looking for opportunities and, you know, talking to the network and just looking for other opportunities. I, I became, um, I became a EOA trainer immediately. As soon, as soon as I left the company, I became an EOA trainer because I wanted to do that anyway. Um, I was accountability coach and mentor before. And so that, you know, sort of kept me busy and, and gave me some passion about people, right? Helping people, mm -hmm. helping entrepreneurs. And so that helped as well, continue, keep that purpose and passion going. And um, um, I, I did land with a company that does business consulting uh, for larger businesses that have executive teams and we help them with vision and strategy and execution. And so I, I work with about five clients uh, for them just on a contract basis, but again, purpose, passion on helping entrepreneurs and business leaders. And, um, and then it was a, it was about a year later and, and my wife, Lana said, this thing's growing and I need help. You've grown businesses. Let's sit down and talk about roles. She's 100% the, she has final say on everything. I make sure she's, As it should she's, be. she's the boss. Uh, <laughs> so both my home and business life, she's the boss. And so, um, uh, we worked together before uh, in, in the in a marketing company, so we understood how to work together and keep it separate. And so we, you know, rules of engagement, clear definitions of of roles, making sure we have clarity, we have uh, dividing lines on decision making, and uh, and it's not without you know some arguments, right? Uh, it's bound to happen, but that's with any partner. And yep. uh, it seemed to go really well. We know our lanes. I'm a visionary and she's 100% an implementer. So, you know, she knows how to organize and run and she's the CEO and runs the business. I'm president, I'm the visionary and I'm looking for opportunities and business development and those types of things. So we, we absolutely know our lanes. It's worked out really well. Nice. And I think, yeah. As you know, Nick and my Nick and I have worked together for twenty seven years. I think it yeah. is now, and um, and we and I'm sure you get the same. You know, people often saying, "Oh, I don't know how you can work together," but I've always taken the view that I can't imagine building a business with anybody else. Um, and and I think we we have even more uh, invested in uh, settling arguments and not taking them home. But I think more importantly, from for employees for our team is not taking home into the office, and that's right. something we've always been very, very conscious of and very, um, I think, very good at and have had that comment actually over the years from staff who've worked for another husband and wife team and comment sort of gone, oh, no, here, here we go again. Uh, but, you know, I think that's for couples who do work together, that's probably even worse than taking work home is taking home into the office. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's right. Absolutely. 
So what of your time now, you're visionary, you're in that sort of business development and, you know, looking from an EOS perspective, you know, it's, you know, big relationships, um, often culture, research and development, or as I like to call it, rip off and duplicate, yes. um, you know, but that, but that sort of big, you know, where are we going and, and you know, um, how are we going to get there and then dragging everybody along. What sort of time do you spend a week in the business right now? What else do you do with your time? What does your week look like? So my, my week right now is I, I am uh, going to publish another book. Uh, so it's, uh, it's pretty much on the shelf ready to publish now. It's gone through editing and test reading and that sort of thing. And it's on about, uh, it's about how to define and some tools to go after whatever success looks like for you as an individual. So, cause everyone's different. Success is different. You know, a lot of people will look at money and, and, um, you know, you and I know that's, that's not, you know, how success is made. It's, uh, there's a lot to do with, you know, connections with people and family and that sort of thing. So, um, so I'm, I'm working on that one. Uh, I do, uh, you know, work with EO. Um, so that's about probably 20% of my time. I do executive business coaching, it's probably 25% of my time. And then uh, helping run and grow this business is probably the rest of it. Um, so that takes me to about midnight. Uh, and then, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the, 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 the quip I heard is, hey, if you want to be an, an entrepreneur and, and free up your time, you can work half time. You just have to decide on if it's the first 12 hours or the second 12 hours. <laughs> So that's yeah, actually so definitely quite true. Keep, yeah. keep busy. Yeah. And and I think in the early stages of, of you know, with a startup, it's, you know, you could go and get a job and work half as much as you do as a startup and probably earn twice. Right. What you do or three times. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's as entrepreneurs we're a we're just a completely different beast to I think the yeah. the rest of the people, um the yeah. non entrepreneurial. Um so it's probably a good thing that we're a, a, a minority. Imagine if the whole world was full of uh, crazy people like us. That's right. That's right. So let's pull one of your tips out of the book. Pull okay. one of those and just let's talk through that. Okay. Uh, so one of the ones, uh, I'll talk about here is, uh, I'm going to pick pitfall number three. Everyone believes they deserve what you have. That's the pitfall. Everyone believes they deserve what you have. And there are stories, uh, uh, in here related to how, um, how, how people have gotten stolen from how, how they're good natured, uh, you know, uh, uh, their willingness to help people and that has been somewhat abused or maybe taken advantage of. And, um, when, when you're running a company, if you own a company without any financial literacy education with your people, they believe that every single dollar of revenue goes to your bank and they think you're, rich Going to the home and rolling right? in cash <laughs> rolling in cash and you just mentioned it very often we're we're unable to pay ourselves sometimes mm. uh to keep everyone else paid and keep the, the the business running and the lights on and uh so you know staff believe that you're making you know all this money and they they some will get a little jaded and actually take extra for themselves mm -hmm. Um, yep. suppliers, uh, will go, oh, if you're doing well, then you should be paying us more. Uh, clients say, well, if, if you're, you're doing that well, you should, you charge, should us less. charge us less. <laughs> so everyone's sort of trying to take a chunk of that, that dollar that you, that you're supposed to be taking home. Um, and, and also partners, you know, if, if, if any, if you have a partnership arrangement and they're, that one perceives the, 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 the partnership to be lopsided in terms of takeaway or not, or doing more work than the other partner, right? This, this is also marriage advice. Um, so doing work, uh, you know, work, more work than another partner, then that partner might feel a little jaded and actually start taking a bit more for themselves. So, uh, I think I can pitfall, take yes to all of those. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the pitfall is really about, um, making sure that you, you know, you have involvement from everyone that you, 
um, that you are you are giving financial literacy, you know, classes, if you will, or, or education somewhat to to all the people that work with you, um, that you have solid agreements, uh, two way agreements with suppliers and clients should all be two way. Like, how can we be a good client to our suppliers as well? And when you have those open relationships, people tend to not get jaded in terms of they think they're being taken advantage of and maybe they should take something a little extra. And there's lots of horror stories in there uh, on entitlement and, you know, uh, people giving themselves raises without any, uh, any authority and, and those types of things. Um, so the tip really is to be transparent uh, and to have very good written um, clarity with all your agreements. Including shareholders agreements. In absolutely 100%. Yeah. yeah, we um we've had several partnerships over the years, and uh, in each of them, we've spent a lot of money getting shareholders agreements going in, which has saved us a lot of money getting out. Um, yeah. Or or meant we've uh, exited with a better um, a better outcome um, financially, perhaps not you know emotionally or any of those sort of things, but financially we've been protected. Um, I'm just a little bit scared. I, I feel like if we go through all 13 of these pitfalls, I'm going to tick yes to all of them. And yeah. and it's interesting. I you know um, often have these conversations. Is that you know this many years in business, and you think you've seen everything, and then something else will happen. Um, when now, when you say transparency, what's been your um, I guess your um, experience and also your um, attitude towards sharing um, high-level financials with employees? Yeah. Uh, I've always been a big proponent of it. You know, my philosophy is, you know, not – so I don't I don't want to make this a direct, rel you know, relative analogy here, but somewhat like when you're speaking with your children – you need to speak to your children's level. You know, if they're in grade two, you'll speak more basic. If they're in high school, you might give more detail. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so same with, you know, the people in your organization, based on their understanding of financials, um, we, we, we believe in, if you give, here's the financial statement, uh, they'll misinterpret a ton of things and, and it'll go back to, gosh, you're, you're making money off our backs. Um, so, you know, they don't understand all the risks we take and, you know, uh, personal guarantees and, you know, liens on mortgages and all those things. Um, and so I, we, but we believe in, uh, and we had monthly classes that uh, was completely voluntary, but you come and we can, we talk about what does, what is profit? Right? How does profit derived in a company? Um, our bit, we had a lot of inventory. And so we talked about when people say, Oh, it's okay. Just write it off and the company gets its money back. Um, so we're like, okay, we need to educate people on what writing, writing off means. means right. Yeah. Um, and, and what that actually, and when, and when we, we talk about, you know, if we lose $1 in profit, how much in sales do we need to make up for that that dollar, right? It's typically 50 to to $100 worth of sales makes up that dollar of profit. And when we showed them this, people really started to take a lot of responsibility and say, hey, I think we could fix that item. We don't need to return it. Um, you know, hey, I think we can save some money with this courier instead of... And so they became really responsible because they started to understand the value of of cost savings and the value of making some profit so a, a company can be sustainable so that really enhanced our desire to be transparent we're transparent at a higher level for sure uh not every line item yeah. um that's and not you necessary don't go down to salaries and that sort of thing but yeah yeah, yeah. and, 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 and one of the, the best practices that i heard a long time ago and i can't remember I, it might have been through rockefeller habits uh originally but it was, as you grow, make sure that there is someone's name accountable to every single line item in your GL. 
-hmm. so that they can manage the budget of that line item. And in the beginning, your name's on all of it, right? Yeah. Um, but as you grow, you can delegate things out. You can delegate, hey, what about the office supplies? What are, That can be delegated to somebody to take care of. Um, and so as we built out, and ideally, your name's not on any of it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, you Absolutely. have people taking care of it <laughs> in yeah. the end. And that way they become responsible and accountable because they have, hey, this is the dividing line of my uh, responsibility as it, as it pertains to the budget or, or you know, the, the parameters of that particular line item on the financials. And that really helped. So, so we, we implemented that as well. I love that. I love the education. And we, um, we didn't go to that level of monthly, but certainly before we shared um, high level financials, which we did at our monthly um, all team meetings, um, everybody, I just found some super simple um, education pieces based on the sort of um, the um, your, your home, you know, your right. home is no dif different to business. You have money coming in and you have to pay your bills and then, at, you know, what's left at the end, um, That's right. sort of, uh, you know, th that um, analogy that people understand. Um, and then when new people came in, they had to watch those videos as well. And, and again, that same sort of engagement, um, and that was mandatory. Everybody had to, but, um, I love the idea of you offering that monthly sort of more in depth, um, uh, education. We did things for our team, like we um, we had a fairly young team, so we had uh, somebody come in one month and um, talk to them about how to set yourself up to buy a house. You know, what mm -hmm. will the bank be looking for so that you can get yes. that mortgage and, um, you know, budgeting and all those sort of things because, you know, just sort of life skills. But, I, yeah, I really love that idea of that sort of deeper education because as the business mm -hmm. grows, you want people to, to really um, understand but and want to um know how their efforts uh, impact the bottom line. Um, so we're getting to the end. And as always, I'm going to ask you to share three tips from all of your years of experience, all of the businesses that you've run, working with your partner, your wife, um, exits, partnerships, all of those sort of things. What are three things that you'd like to share with the people listening to our podcast? Great. Th thanks, Jenny. And I'm going to pull from hundreds of things. You know, obviously there's, there's a lot more than three, but I'm going to pick three of sort of my main ones that I, that, that if, you know, if asked like I am now, um, I, I will tell you the number one, the, the, the most important thing is, uh, I mentioned it earlier. If you want to grow your business, you need to grow your people. And so that means education, that means um, giving people an opportunity to have some autonomy over their their jobs, their roles, you know, defining the boundaries there, but giving people an opportunity to to thrive in their positions, to to maybe make, you know, make some suggestions on how to improve it. Uh, absolutely make it safe so that they can challenge some things that might not be working. And so you really get involvement from people and help them grow as individuals. Uh, we, we brought in, you know, um, people that did, you know, spine alignment. Uh, we brought in people that did uh, personal, you know, personal financing and budgeting. We, we brought in all sorts of personal things because we wanted to have people grow because if they grow and they're involved, uh, your clients are going to feel that, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to, they're going to see that type of engagement. Um, you know, much like the term happy wife, happy life, or happy spouse, happy house, uh, is a better oh, way of putting one. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's happy employees, happy customers. Yeah. So, uh, so that's one. The second part to that is if you want to grow your people, you need to first grow yourself. So that is the part that's missing is we need to grow as people if we want to grow people. So we've got to be on a constant learning journey. We've got to read books, have, you know, peer networks, connect, grow ourselves, learn more tools, do, you know, there's, there's myriad amounts of, of self-assessment tools out there that can teach you. Uh, last year I did a, an EQ test and had a two hour consult on EQ. I felt like I knew that part of me fairly well. And I learned some 
invaluable things that I never thought of before. And it's wow. really, I have, I've been different ever since. And so there's a, if you're in that constant learning and growing, then it's easier for you to help people learn and grow. Um, so that's sort so of what a, was that a, one that you did just to not to give anybody else it, a plug, but I, it, I'm interested. So it, it it was just it was just called an EQ test, and it okay. was uh, um, uh, another consultant coach that does that that certified on it. It, okay. it didn't have its name; it's she just had it as an EQ, an EQ test. assessment. Nice. And um, it was uh, it was eye opening for for me in some areas. Um, the actual results came in. I wasn't surprised by the results. It was our conversation after when we were talking about, um, um, and I'll give you the example. There's there's your strength, and then with every strength, there's what she calls a shadow. So if you uh, have this strength and you're using it too much the shadow of it could be an opposite effect for somebody else and it was really okay. interesting how and again there's a lot more to it but it's interesting how that conversation came about that uh oh, oh, an overuse of your strength could actually cause uh someone else not to be able to connect and and that sort of thing because eq is about communication and um, yeah. so, so that's a two-parter, uh, right? So there's the, mm -hmm. the grow your business, grow your people, grow your, grow your people, grow yourself. And, and lastly, uh, we, we touched on this before, but I cannot, uh, in, in a lot of the pitfalls in the book, one of, one of the tips is a, like a repeat in many of them. And we spoke about it is get every, have an agreement in writing for everything. If you have a partnership shareholder agreement, yes, you're married uh, and, and you're a partner, you know, you and Nick are partners, have a shareholder agreement. It's in writing. You have all the scenarios that could go wrong because when you're creating a partnership, all you can think of is what is going to go right. Mm -hmm. And so you need to think about what's going to go wrong and how do we cover that off amicably and equitably in a shareholder agreement in writing. So, uh, you know, when I got in business with my parents, you know, my dad said, Hey, we're cool. We'll, you know, we'll just have a handshake. And I said, no, I'm told that we need to put it in writing. And so we put it in writing and it did save our relationship. And that, that was more important than the business. It saved yeah. our relationship. So, uh, ha make sure you have solid employment agreements, partnership agreements, supplier agreements, client agreements, um, that are really spelled out and super clear. So really it's, 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 it protects you for sure legally, but you know, what it does is protect your relationships so that if things are clear, you can always refer to it. And then there's less strife, there's less lawsuits, you know, there's, you keep your friends longer, you know, that sort of thing. So really important. Mm. No, I love that. And Nick and I don't have a partner agreement. We, uh, yeah, we'd never, we've never actually had one, um, as in a, a business one. We've definitely had it with other partners, but, right. uh, but never he nor I. But, um, one thing that we did improve drastically when we implemented EOS was those lanes. And you touched on this with your wife, uh, you and your wife very clear on, on our lanes. And, yeah. and I guess that gave us that terminology without having that agreement, formal agreement between us. It gave us that clarity of, uh, when I was straying into Nick's lane or he strayed into mine, right. just that clarity. Uh, but that was well, well, well down the path of, of us working together. And um, and that was definitely a, a, a big um, a contentious issue prior to that of, you know, um, the things that I didn't like doing, I expected him to do and vice versa. Yeah. And then yeah. we'd get mad at each other if we if neither of us did it um, and mad at each other if both of us did it. Um, but that, you know, uh, that agreement definitely, uh, you know, um, keep Keeps us all honest and making us do the things that we uh, that we don't want to do as well as the things that we do want to do. Yeah, so, and really, uh, you know, providing a, the maximum amount of value, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And everybody then has something to fall back on. And uh, yeah, like I said, the, the most amount of value. Well, Nick, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate. I didn't actually ask you. So it's around 11.25 a.m. here in Bali. What time is it for you? It's 8.25 p.m. Here, so it's here um, I'm you're back in time. You're uh, yeah. last night my time. So That's right. Really, yeah. um, I'll tell you what the weather's like today. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, I already did, and you didn't want to know. No, so no, no. 
Again, yeah. thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. So Thanks, Nick's book, we'll put it into the links uh, on this podcast. Uh, so Nick Thompson, uh, the book is called Look Out. You're about to get effed. 13 Biggest Pitfalls of Business and How to Avoid Them and really looking forward to Let's do another one of these when your new book's released and um, and I'm sure I will see you around the EO traps, but um, do really do appreciate your time. For sure. Thanks so much, Jenny. Really appreciate it.